Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to Breaking Down Barriers to InfoSec for uh, Neurodivergent Individuals with Rin and Oliver. <laughs> I'm Jasmine, um, and I have a couple housekeeping announcements really quick. Um, first, I would like to give a shout out to Diana Initiative's Diamond Platinum um, Gold uh, Village and CTF sponsors, which are MongoDB, Microsoft, Verizon, Salesforce, uh, Amazon Information Security, eLearn Security, Remediant, and Intel. And also really quickly, um, every track has a raffle prize each day. So uh, if you head to stage, there is a pinned raffle. It's an easy to enter. Um, I am very happy to introduce Ren Oliver, um, whose pronouns are they and them. Um, Rin is something I'm very proud to call a colleague. Um, they are an expert and highly engaged community member um, on all things open source, uh, with a particular uh, expertise on tech diversity, um, neurodivergent individuals in tech, and how to break down barriers to contribution for them within OSS communities. Um, and Rin also enjoys making candles, her, I'm sorry, their rescue animals and spending time with their wife. Thank you, Rin. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining me and welcome to Breaking Down Barriers to Information Security for Neurodivergent Individuals. Uh, we only have 20 minutes, so I'm actually going to jump right in and get started. I hope you all can read my captions and we're going to get going here, hopefully. So first things first, we're going to define what is neurodiversity. Neurodiversity is broadly defined in academia and across mental health professions as an umbrella term for the following. Autism, ADD, ADHD, Tourette's, dyspraxia, dyslexia, dyscalculia, specific speech conditions, sensory processing conditions, and many more. Um, I'd like to make a note that among many neurodivergent individuals, there's been a recent movement to accept and embrace the validity of specific speech conditions and self-diagnosis and our own unique lived experiences. And when discussing neurodiversity, remember an individual is neurodivergent rather than neurodiverse. So first things first, we'd like to address the challenge of contributing to open source software. Contributing to open source is often recommended as a way for neurodivergent individuals to kickstart their career in tech. Contributing to open source is usually seen as a way for new developers to apply what they've learned to a project and learn to work with the team if they haven't already. So the problem with that is that contributing to open source can be really daunting and it's even inaccessible for many neuro neurodivergent individuals due to excessive use of jargon in open source communities, having unclear contribution guidelines, there's no one to turn to when they have a question, and there's often really lengthy, confusing documentation to read before they can even get started contributing. When suggesting open source as a way to kickstart one's career, you've really got to make sure that the project's documentation is accessible. Contributor pathways have clearly defined paths for progression and that there's a directly responsible individual that neurodivergent people can go to with any questions that they might have. Having that contact point that they can go to if they face a bug in their setup or if they have a question about, if a, uh, about their pull request is huge. It's really nice to have that person that they can go to and be like, I have a question, I have a problem, something's not working for me, can you help me? So they're not having to wander through your GitHub documentation trying to find a, whoever an issue is assigned to and pray that they might help them. <laughs> so let's talk really quick about roadblocks to career advancement. There's so many of these and traditional interview processes are designed with bias ingrained in them. The biggest example I can see of this is by far interviewing for culture fit. If your organization is interviewing for culture fit, you are inherently biased in a lot of ways against neurodivergent individuals because a lot of times culture fit just means we want someone to answer this interview question in a way that is accepted as socially um, socially acceptable by neuro neurotypical individuals. So it's a it's an unspoken cheat sheet. And it's a really large bias that is hard to overcome, I would say. 
for a lot of neurodivergent individuals. <clears throat> Unspoken rules of social interaction often lead to lost career opportunities for neurodivergent individuals. Some neurodivergent people can be seen as and are often unfairly labeled by neurotypical colleagues as disruptive, abrasive, or seen as rocking the boat due to their communication style. And this can lead to less pathways for furthering their careers, and in some cases, may lead to performance improvement plans, layoffs, or termination. And I have a dog, and he is barking like you would not believe right now. <laughs> the performance improvement plan process is overwhelmingly designed to punish neurodivergent workers for not performing to arbitrary neurotypical standards of production, output, and project scope. So if you're thinking about putting a neurodivergent person on a performance improvement plan, I highly suggest maybe not doing that. <laughs> so what can you as an employer do? Good question. So let's talk about some recommendations for employers to actually succeed when it comes to interviewing, retaining, and attracting neurodivergent talent. Reimagine how you look at the interview process. This looks like avoiding smart style interview questions. Those tell me about a time when questions are really difficult for neurodivergent people because they'll answer those questions brutally honestly. Oftentimes their interviewer is neurotypical and doesn't want a brutally honest answer, but they won't tell their neurodivergent candidate that. Implement screening processes where you don't use video software and try to limit your bias as much as possible. And this is really important because a lot of bias is inherent in video screening. So whenever you can try to do, um, I guess the term would be low visibility interviews where you know as little about your candidate as possible and hire them for what they can do rather than whatever your perceived notions of them are. Set up neurodivergent employees for success with a new approach to performance reviews and work with people to create their performance goals rather than assigning them arbitrarily without their input. If people have a stake in their own success, they're much more likely to succeed. Ask them what success looks like to them and figure out where they'd like to be in terms of their career. You can also encourage creation of employee resource groups for neurodivergent employees to connect with one another. And employers should collaborate with neurodivergent individuals themselves to remove barriers to paid work and open source contribution for neurodivergent individuals. Primarily talk to us, not about us. That's a really big thing to remember is that people like to talk about neurodiversity, but they don't actually talk to neurodivergent individuals. We're here, most of us would like to talk to you, I'm sure. And we'd love to have input on discussions that especially impact our lives and our careers. So how can we improve information security? How can we make this better? I'm going to leave you with a few thoughts here to take away and we can ruminate on those and hopefully brainstorm some suggestions. So what do you feel that we as a community can do to improve the information security open source contributor experience, career trajectory, and learning outcomes for those that are neurodivergent? And how can we best introduce those solutions in a real, meaningful way that enacts change in the community? And lastly, what are one or two things that you feel would make a career in information security more accessible to those that are neurodivergent? And how are you going to build upon what you've learned today to implement those in your own organization and communities? So last thing is if you're interested in participating in the continuous improvement of an open source GitLab repository, building on what we've learned in this session, please feel free to contact me on Twitter. I'm at K-I-R-A-N underscore Oliver on GitLab or I'm on GitHub at C-E-L-A-N-T-H-E. And I would like to thank you so very much for coming to my presentation. I truly appreciate it. And I'm happy to answer some questions if anybody has any. Fantastic. That was wonderful. Thank you so much. I have um, put a chat message asking for questions, but I wanted Beautiful. to share a, um, a comment from Kim Crawley, which I feel like is really oh, cool. profound. The number one thing that harms disabled people is when able people act as experts about us. That's very well true. Spoken. That is, that is well-spoken and super true. Um, so I have a question. 
Um, sure. You you touch briefly on um, you know the the kind of responsible person who who's kind of onboarding contributors within OSS communities. Um, mm -hmm. Do you have any kind of recommendations on how they can be more more inclusive and re remove barriers? I would say for onboarding and open source communities, having a clear contributor guide is huge. Having people that are whose job it is to actually help new people is great. A good example of this is Kubernetes. There's the contributor experience SIG, and the contributor experience SIG helps new contributors get started. And they also have a really well-detailed contributor guide that lays out the contributor process from start to finish, what you can expect when you submit a PR, how to do so, what bots will be running, how to sign the CLI, et cetera. So making sure that all that information is easily accessible and that there's somebody to talk to if you have a question and you know where that person is and who they are is huge. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And I've got actually some kind of adjacent questions from Mary Wiseman and Emily Gladstone Cole. Um, and they ask, what are some suggestions for better interview techniques? And also, can you talk more about better interview questions and how to write them? Absolutely. Interview questions are great and I love them, but I also would really love for people to get to know neurodivergent individuals as just that individuals. When you have interview questions that are like, tell me about a time when they really don't, you get, don't get to know somebody as an individual because you're forcing them to regurgitate a scripted answer to a scripted question that doesn't allow for flexibility or creativity. You basically want, you're basically testing their memory and how quick they can think on their feet which for some neurodivergent people is really difficult to do. I know for me, I've had interview questions where hours later, I think of an answer and I'm like, mm, didn't say that in the interview. Well, now what? <laughs> so I think that really revising your interview questions to get to know somebody without expecting a scripted automatic answer is great. So really making sure that your questions um, get you the answers you want in your recruiting process and not i wouldn't I, actually you know what i wouldn't even say get you the answers you want because that's a bias in and of itself so you've really got to work on that um it's such a hard thing interviewing especially for neurodivergent people because there's such an unspoken set of rules to interviewing that is so skewed toward neurotypical behavior and neurotypical responses that we will never know Honestly, and if we do, if we are doing it, we're probably masking, and that's emotionally um, taxing too. So it's 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 hard. And I would say that as much as you can, revise your interview questions to be less scripted and allow for flexibility in when and how you answer that question. That's really fantastic advice. Thank you. Um, I have another um, some more wisdom from Kim, Kim Crawley coming in hot. Um, I think too much cool. emphasis on degrees and certs is an industry barrier for neurodivergent people. The public wow. school system failed me. I dropped out of school. I wasn't formally diagnosed with autism, ADHD until I was 35. That's very true. And, I wasn't uh, formally diagnosed until I was in my 30s as well. It's rough. Wow. Um, Rivka Skidmore. Uh, is asking your opinion on a particular interview question that we've all gotten, which is describe something that you're passionate about. Ha, ah, I like that one, but I also don't because again, this falls into the don't answer this question honestly trap. They want you to answer it, but they don't want you to answer it in a way that makes you seem weird. And I air quote that because autistic people often have what is known as special interests. Mine, for example, is the ABC show Once Upon a Time. Please, I beg of you, talk to me on Twitter about Once Upon a Time. It will bring me joy. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm pretty sure that a job interviewer is not going to want to hear about Once Upon a Time for 20 minutes or however long they want me to talk about that. I'm also pretty sure they're not going to want to hear about making candles. Neither of these things they want to hear about. They want you to have a hobby, and they want you to see that you have a life outside of work. But it, the truth is they want to hear, oh, I code outside of work. They don't want to hear about the cool stuff you actually do. And that's sad. So if you're going to ask somebody like something like that, I would say expect an honest answer, especially if your candidate is neurodivergent. Don't expect to hear something like, all I do in my spare time is code. I eat, sleep, and breathe code. Nobody does that. And if they do, God is blessed. More power to you. But I'm not that person. <laughs> Um, so here's a really interesting question from Jennifer Santiago. Um, they asked, do you self-identify as a autistic when you apply for jobs? 
Heck yes. But I will say that I have done an A-B split test on not doing that and doing that. I have checked the ticky box that says I have a disability and I have not checked it. And I have seen that when I do not check the ticky box, I get less auto replies that say, no, we don't want you for a job, which I'm pretty sure is illegal, but they do it anyway. So that sucks. Um, so I'm, I do self DX and what I like is seeing the, um, not the federal one where it's like, have you ever had a disability? Tell the government, the one where it's like, they give you the option to tell them yourselves. They have their own form on um, greenhouse where you can add, like, do you have a disability? Do you identify as a member of the LGBT community? And you can check the ticket box. Those I like, cause that gives you an opportunity to say more about yourself, but it also doesn't automatically get you in the no pile, which checking the federal ticket box I find does. So yes, I identify as autistic when I count on job applications. And I think that in a lot of cases, the way I see it is if I check that box and they don't want me, then they didn't want me. They don't want me to bring all of me to work. Then they didn't want me. So, I think you don't want them. Exactly. Ugh. If they don't want a hundred percent, somebody is a hundred percent and that includes their disability, then they don't, they, I don't know who they're looking for, but it's certainly not me. So, <laughs> um, we've got a yeah. great question from Adina E. Um, awesome. which is where can you find resources to help neurodivergent people learn and excel in InfoSec? Most people I've talked to Ooh. say to self-teach, figure it out on your own. I think that's something that most of us have heard. Um, but how and yeah. where do you find people to teach to neurodivergent individuals' needs? I honestly love the work that the BBC is doing. The BBC CAPE initiative is great. Um, the BBC has an ho a whole neurodivergent um, arm of its uh, entire workforce that they're really trying hard to work on that. And the UK is actually really great about neurodiversity in general, as opposed to the U S in a lot of ways, they have a dyspraxia Institute. That's really great. For example, whereas the U S is just now catching on to dyspraxia in so many ways. Um, I have dyspraxia as well as being autistic and dyscalculia. So I'm a wonderful unicorn of neurodiversity, but um, I really think that self learning is difficult in a lot of ways, especially for people that have ADD, I have ADD too. And self-learning is really hard for me because it requires so much uh, time management and executive function. So I really think that self-learning is a slippery slope for people that are neurodivergent. And I would say, I would recommend um, really building a community if you can. And that's where the open source thing comes in handy and encouraging employee resource groups because if you have a neurodivergent employee resource group, and you have an open source community where neurodivergent people are free to interact and build their own communities to help one another. And we can come together as a team to accomplish more. And that way, if you're around other neurodivergent individuals, there's going to be more tips that are actually going to work for you in terms of how you learn and how you process information. Very cool. Thank you. Um, and I think we've got time for one or two more questions. Wonderful. That would be great. Yeah, I'm happy to answer any that anybody has for sure. Um, this has been a real joy. Thank you. Yeah, uh, this has been fantastic. Um, I guess I would be curious about kind of any any kind of quick quick hit recommendations you have for individuals who are not. Um, self-identifies as neurodivergent to be better allies within communities. I would say go check out the Autistic Self-Advocacy Network. That's a pretty great place to start. Um, mm -hmm. Like I said, the Dyspraxia Foundation. Um, I would definitely check out um, Twitter is a great place. Um, the hashtag actually autistic is really great. Um, and then I would say that just um, start your own start that dialogue in your company start the dialogue and get an employee resource group get people together get them talking because you never know what you're going to learn about people people may have been masking and you won't even know so until you ask they might have felt uncomfortable so if you get that ball rolling and you start that discussion without like putting people on the spot it's really nice because like a lot of people are shy they might not want to talk about how they're handling it. But if you give them the door to say, I'm struggling, I am neurodivergent, and I've been masking, and it's been really hard for me, and you might end up finding out a lot more about your coworkers and having an opportunity to help them succeed in ways that you couldn't even imagine. 
Well, thank you so much for sharing um, so honestly and openly and authentically today. Um, Kim Crawley says, thank you, Asan. Uh, Cheryl Biswas says, loved your talk. Um, and she she loves Once Upon a Time as well. Um, so thank you Hi. so much, Ren. Thank you very much, everyone. It was a real pleasure. Thank you. And I hope you enjoy the rest of the event. It's great. I'll see you um, in on the stages and I'll be volunteering throughout the rest of the day. Feel free to connect with me on Twitter and I hope you have a wonderful day. Thanks.